Hello, good to see you. Pastor Sam with a devotion from Jeremiah chapter 25. Today, we get to dig into the nature of good and evil. Ooh, what a topic. And um, the, the uh, textual point of our discussion is the people spending time in the exile and then God punishing the people that he is helping. And so we see a lot of just stuff happening. But um, we'll be able to dig into a little bit. God is going to use some kind of technical terms that we'll talk about, and that lets us uh, have some opportunity to discuss the nature of things that are good and the nature of things that are evil. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are going to be reading not all of chapter 25, uh, the first section, first 14 verses or so. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, which Jeremiah the prophet spoke to all the people of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem for 23 years from the 13th year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, to this day. The word of the Lord has come to me, and I have spoken persistently to you, but you have not listened. You have neither listened nor inclined your ears to hear, although the Lord persistently sent to you all his servants the prophets, saying, Turn now, every one of you, from his evil way and evil deeds, and dwell upon the land that the Lord has given to you and your fathers from of old and forever. Do not go after other gods to serve and worship them, or provoke me to anger with the work of your hands. Then I will do you no harm. Yet you have not listened to me, declares the Lord, that you might provoke me to anger with the work of your hands to your own harm. Therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not obeyed my words, behold, I will send for all the tribes of the north, declares the Lord, and for Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon, my servant, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants, and against all these surrounding nations. I will devote them to destruction, and make them a horror, a hissing, and an everlasting desolation. Moreover, I will banish from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the grinding of the millstones and the light of the lamp. This whole land shall become a ruin and a waste, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. Then, after seventy years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, declares the Lord, making the land an everlasting waste. I will bring upon that land all the words that I have uttered against it, everything written in this book, which Jeremiah prophesied against all the nations. For many nations and great kings shall make slaves even of them, and I will recompense them according to their deeds and the work of their hands. So just to say where we're going, devote them to destruction. That is the technical term that we are going to be discussing today. Before we get into this term, um, we want to talk a little bit about what is happening within this text and and kind of along with that this text prophesies some things that will happen in the future so like all of that together sort of leads us into this technical term devote devote to destruction them is not um relevant today at least as far as discussing this word so what god is doing and this will lead very nicely into the nature of good and evil God is using, I want to make sure I come at this in the right order. God has given his word to the people of the earth, most, most especially his own people, and the people of the earth, and again, most especially his own people, have chosen repeatedly not to listen to it as in God's own words, because you have not obeyed my words, God is going to punish them. 
God is, and, and now here's kind of the weird part. We're not going to talk so much about this particularly, but we will kind of talk about the nature of good and evil. God is going to use a godless, wicked nation to punish his people who do not obey him. God is going to use something evil to do something good. And then, so that you don't think Babylon is getting away from it, uh, I will punish the king of Babylon and the land of the Chaldeans. God, and, and so everyone gets what they deserve is the bottom line, the end of the story. Now, I want to, that was, that was fast. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, where did I have it? Devote to destruction. So, if you have, and mine might look a little bit different than yours, if you have a study Bible, a Lutheran study Bible, there are quite a few helpful notes in that study Bible. And I'm sure there's nearly countless times that I have encouraged you uh, either to get one of those or to use one of those. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about what I did and then kind of why that's helpful. So I, I, um, I had an idea that actually ended up being right, so that was nice to find out. But I had an idea that this was kind of so a technical term. A technical term uh, means a word that's used to always refer to this thing. That would be a technical term. And when God says devote to destruction, he means the same thing by it. Anyway, what I did, I looked in Jeremiah 25 at the note, devote to destruction, and the study Bible pointed me back to uh, kind of some introductory notes at the beginning of the Old Testament that talked about several technical terms or concepts. Um, the Hebrew word kesed, which we usually translate as love or steadfast love, is one such technical term with a myriad of um, different meanings. I don't want to get sidetracked into that. Other things like holy was another technical term. And uh, devote to destruction is the opposite of holy. And that's kind of what led me towards uh, the nature of good and evil. Now, we're not talking necessarily about God in this. God is good. Let me get that out of the way. Um, and it's a little bit easier if we start the discussion with things that are good or holy and then move into things that are evil or devoted to destruction. God is uh, substantially, materially, physio physiologically, essentially, in, in his essence, different from his creation. Right? Nothing in all of creation is any such representation of who God is or what he does. Man is made in the image of God, and that's about the closest that we come. And, and there's been plenty of ink spilled on what in the world it means to be made in the image of God. I'm not going to get into that either. God's creation is not God, first of all. And, and I will argue, at least in this devotion, is not a reflection of of God. Now that's not what I, I mean that in kind of a specific way because if you push me I will say creation does reveal certain things about God and Paul will make the argument in Romans 1 that people can see God's invisible attributes in the creation but what I mean here I'm not arguing against St. Paul what I mean here is that by looking at creation we cannot know God directly. And in uh, theology, we call 
creation. Um, oh, shoot. I just had the term. Indirect revelation. There we go. The creation is an indirect revelation of God. By looking out at creation, my window's over there, you, you ought to come to the conclusion that something made this. But you cannot arrive at the conclusion that the Christian God made this, much less that the Christian God became incarnate in Jesus Christ, was crucified, died, rose, and ascended to provide you salvation. Like you, There's no way you get that by looking at trees. And that's, that's more what I mean, that the creation is not a reflection of God. God made it, and there are ways to see his invisible attributes, like Paul says in Romans 1. But, kind of back to our point, uh, when God made things, he did not intrinsically make them either holy or, I'm going to use the word evil, right? Either holy or evil. So, um, the stones, let's think back to, to this time, the stones that made up the temple of God on the day that they were created were not any such special stones. There is nothing materially different, nothing extra, nothing special about the stones that were used to make the temple. Why then was the temple considered holy? Well, it's not because of the stuff that was in there. It was because God chose, I will argue arbitrarily, and, and more on that in a little bit, God chose arbitrarily to dwell in this structure in the city of Jerusalem. By virtue of God's dwelling, he hallows, makes holy, the stones, the city, all that stuff. So the stuff, the creation, is neither holy nor evil by virtue of its own right, but only insofar as it relates to God, only insofar as God reveals his thoughts and attitudes toward them. And this is really what takes us into the nature of good and evil. Now, sometimes there's a question that comes up, which I think is sort of a frivolous question. Was there good stuff that God said we should do, or because God said we should do stuff, is it good? Like, is the stuff good, and God said we should do that, or because God said the stuff is good, we should do it? And, and it gets, it, it kind of gets at what I'm driving at. Are there certain aspects of creation that are holy in themselves and God realizing that these things are holy in themselves commands us to do them? Well, no, because then the things would be God. Like a thing which is holy in itself is God. Somebody who realizes that is not God. He's just a smart person. Think about different foods. And I often joke about this. Um, you know, we tomatoes tomatoes and potatoes right the berries that grow on tomato plants are delicious we make those into spaghetti but the berries that grow on potato plants kill you i would not want to be the first dude who ate a potato fruit right that that's an example of a thing that is healthy or harmful they they are so in their own right but me commanding you to eat one or the other does not make them healthy or harmful. It just makes me a smart person to know that I should eat the tomato fruit, but I should not eat the potato fruit, the berries growing on the potato plant. So God didn't realize, hey, we should, like, people should, like, worship me one day. Hang on, I have to back up because I'm trying to prove what I think is the point. God didn't realize that there was a special day called the Sabbath and then think, what can people do on this special day called the Sabbath? Well, they should probably worship me. Because then the Sabbath would actually be God, right? The thing that is holy or good or right with no explanation is God. When we've, when we've arrived at the highest realm of authority, that is our definition of God. So is the Sabbath 
holy on its own and God just realized it was holy and told us to worship him. No. No. God rested on the seventh day and by virtue of his resting made the day holy. We just had that as our Old Testament reading this Sunday. Because God rested on the Sabbath, therefore the Sabbath day became holy by its relation to God it gained holiness so God doesn't realize things are good and tells us to do them God tells us things to do and those things are by definition good this is a very useful chain of logic at several points in the Old Testament because there are some points and and this is potentially one of them which is kind of why I wanted to talk about the nature of good and evil where we'll ask something like how could God X right how could God do this that's wrong and we don't realize what we're saying whatever God does is good Whatever God does is right. Wherever God is, whatever God touches, whatever God uses is holy. Not because of its own self, but by virtue of his using it, by virtue of its relationship or proximity to him. So God could, in theory, wake up tomorrow and tell us that we can't drink water anymore. Water is actually no good. You can't drink water ever again. God, God has full authority to do that. I don't think he's going to do that. So it's probably safe for you to buy some water at the grocery store. But he could, in theory, do that. All of a sudden, wake up. God doesn't wake up. This is kind of an anthropomorphism. God could wake up one morning and all of a sudden decide, this is no good. And tell us, this is no good. And that would just be it. There's no argument. There's no rationale needed god might have some rationale that he would reveal to us but he could just say water is bad can't drink water anymore done end of story is there anything wrong with water no water is neither holy nor evil in its own right but i'm glad i picked water i was thirsty god can use water say in a baptism to do very good things and by virtue of its connection to God, the water becomes life-giving and life-saving. The water, since I've chosen water, could also be rain for 40 days and 40 nights, a la Genesis 6 through 9, and drown all living things, except for Noah and his family and the animals on the ark. Right? The things that God uses become good by virtue of God using them. So that question that I kind of started off with, are there things that are good that God then tells us to do, or does God tell us to do things and they are good? It's the second one. God tells us to do things, and those things become by definition good. God tells us not to do things, and those things become by definition evil. Not because they are good or evil in themselves, but just because of God's command, which I kind of said that I would talk about this later, which is in some way arbitrary, right? Why is it the case that you eat the tomato fruit and not the potato fruit? I don't know, because God made the tomato fruit healthy and we get delicious spaghetti. And the potato fruit is a relative of nightshade and it'll kill you if you eat enough of them. Why did he do that? I don't know. He, he can do whatever he wants at any point that he wants for any reason that he wants. Like that's, that's what being God is. He has full power, authority, and potential to do anything and everything with no explanation whatsoever, no accountability needed. Like that is utter unchained freedom and that is something that only God has. Getting back to the nature of good and evil, good is anything that God uses. 
anything that God chooses to locate his self close to. The temple becomes holy, not because the stones were so cool, but because God was there. The king of Babylon becomes, and God will actually say this later. I didn't read this second part of the chapter, but I wonder if I can find it. He actually calls King Nebuchadnezzar his servant. Ah, I don't know if I can find it. King Nebuchadnezzar becomes, dare I say holy? Maybe I, maybe I shouldn't say that. King Nebuchadnezzar becomes at least good, not because he as a person is materially different from any other person, not because he as a person has chosen to love and follow God, simply because God decided to use Nebuchadnezzar to accomplish his desires. So Nebuchadnezzar is a holy instrument, maybe that's how I can say it, is a holy instrument of God, a thing that God uses to accomplish what God wants done. Then God can turn right around and punish the king of Babylon and the land of the Chaldeans. And that's kind of where we come back to where we started, devote to destruction. So God will sometimes use the word uh, set apart to mean holy. And, and again, we can think about the stones of the temple. We can think about the gold uh, overlaid on the, the, the utensils of the temple. None of those are special or whatever on their own, but they have been set apart for service to God. And by virtue of their service to God, they become holy uh, instruments, holy implements. Think about, and Pastor Erbach talked about this uh, in his sermon, think about the pulpit. The wood of the pulpit was just wood. There were two boards sitting there and somebody chose to use this board and didn't choose to use that board, not because this board was holy or because there was a cross inscribed on it or something, but they just picked this one and it became the pulpit, a place where God's word is proclaimed to his people. And it's the by virtue of that proclamation that the pulpit becomes a holy place and a holy thing because of its relationship to God. It has been set apart for proclaiming the gospel. The opposite of being set apart for God is then being set apart from God, or back to the technical term, devoted to destruction. Now the note in the study Bible gives really good insight, and I would encourage you if you have a study Bible, it's uh, kind of at the beginning of the Old Testament, even before the book of Genesis, before the introduction to the book of Genesis. And, and, and it's that word, devote to destruction. There's a Hebrew word, uh, karam. You got to clear your throat. Haram is uh, to devote to destruction. And it's the idea of separating for the sake of destruction, right? It's, that, it's still that same idea. This thing is set apart not for service to God, but now for separation and annihilation and, and distance from God. It, it's still the same action. And that's what I thought was so cool uh, about this verse, is that in either case, whether it's holy or it's evil, it's set apart, it's distinguished in some way. Now, obviously, it's much better to be holy and to be set apart for God than it is to be evil and to be set apart from God. But in either case, the same action is happening. Not because the people are such in themselves, but again, because of their relationship to God. They are either, in the words of Peter, a holy priesthood set apart for God, 
or in this case in Jeremiah, devoted to destruction, set apart from God. And they are removed from the land, removed from God's presence in the city of Jerusalem, removed from, at least we can say, God's face. Now, God doesn't abandon them, and that's kind of part of the message of the coming chapters in the book of Jeremiah, is for God to reassure his people, yes, you are removed from this place where you used to worship me, but you are not removed from my presence. My presence goes with you even into the exile. And that's a word of comfort that he will speak to them. But at this point, um, God is separating his people, not for the sake of be, them being a light to the nations, that was his original intent, but for the sake of destroying them. Hopefully, at this point in the devotion, you can answer my question. Is God devoting his people to destruction a holy thing or an evil thing? Again, anything that God does is, by its very definition, a holy thing. God can't do anything bad, right? That's one of them, their paradoxes. Like, anything that God does is holy, so can God ever do evil? No, because the definition of good or holy is whatever God does. So could God do something that God doesn't do? No, of course not. That's crazy. God, God, God literally can't do an evil thing. It is, it is technically impossible for him to do an evil thing. Because for him to do an evil thing, he would have to do something that he doesn't do. But of course, anything that God does is something that God does, and anything that God does is holy. So everything that God does is holy. All of this happens by its relationship to God. Are God's people holy or are they evil? It depends on their relationship to God. And at this point in the relationship, they are evil. They have repeatedly, in God's own words, not obeyed his words. And again, not once or twice, but where does Jeremiah say it? Um, Although the Lord persistently sent to you all his servants, the prophets, saying, Turn now every one of you. Right? God has persistently sent people to warn his people, Hey, I have called you to holiness. You have not been living in the way of holiness, which is to say, you have been living apart from a relationship to me. You have not been living in accordance with my words and in relationship with me. You have been living outside of them. Stop that. Come back to live in relationship with me. Come back to keeping my words, listening, hearing, following my words. Come back to those things. That is what God has been persistently asking his people to do. And they have not. So the people have slowly been moving themselves further and further away from God until we get to the point where God actually says, I will devote them to destruction. I am separating them. I am setting them apart. No longer for the sake of holiness. No longer to make them holy. But because they have abandoned the relationship with me. And things are either evil or holy by virtue of their relationship with God. A thing that abandons its relationship with God is and must be evil. A thing which enters and remains in relationship with God is and must be holy. Not by virtue of its own self, but only because of its relationship to God. So think about yourself. Are you a holy person or are you an evil person? It doesn't matter the constituent molecules of your being, of your physical person. That plays no role in it whatsoever. It doesn't even matter the actions that you have committed. What matters is your present relationship with God. Do you hear God's word 
follow God's word, love and trust in him. If that is true, you are in relationship with God, you are in proximity with God, and you are holy. Else, evil. That's, that's the difference between good and evil, right? Is not us on our own. So the, the and, and kind of co coinciding with this is the nature of like self-salvation. Can I ever make myself good? Well, no. To make myself good, to make myself holy, would be to f somehow force myself into a relationship with God and a relationship that he does not want. Can I ever force myself into doing something that God does not want done? No. If I could, I would be God. And God wouldn't. If I could force God to do something that God doesn't want to do, I would be God. And I am definitely not God. So, like, the idea of us saving ourselves for multiple reasons, but especially for this reason today, is utterly impossible. Because that would be to put ourselves in a position that is somehow apart from God and yet in relationship with God. And, and that just doesn't happen. So people are good if they are in relationship with God. They are holy. You are holy if you are in relationship with God. And you are evil. People are evil. I shouldn't say you are evil, because I hope you aren't. People are evil if they have no such relationship with God, no matter what actions they might commit. And this is sometimes lots, lots of rabbit holes to track down today. This is sometimes difficult for us to imagine because we conjure up the idea of a sweet old lady who, is not, who does not love God, and, and we, we hesitate to call such a person evil. And what we're trying to do is say that somehow this person is holy by virtue of her own self and apart from a relationship to God. And in doing so, we make this sweet old lady God. I don't know whether you realize you're doing that or not. For that sweet old lady to be good, she has to be God. That's the only way to be made good and the only way to be made holy is to either be God yourself or to be in proximity and relationship to God. The only way to be evil is to be outside of proximity and relationship to God. Circling back to our text. Circling back to our text. There we go. Nebuchadnezzar is for a while a holy instrument of God. God is using him to accomplish a thing. And Nebuchadnezzar has some to, oh, here it is. Here it is. My servant. Whew. Look at that. My servant. It's on the same screen within a verse. Nebuchadnezzar, my servant, is God's servant. Right? That's also my job description. I am God's servant. Um, Nebuchadnezzar is God's servant not because of any such characteristics within him, not because of anything that he or his country have done, but simply because God decided, hey, I'm going to use Nebuchadnezzar to do a thing right now. And later, God is going to uh, punish that same person that he had been using. Because Nebuchadnezzar is not good on his own, while God is using him, he is a good thing. But after God is done using him, is he in relationship with God or not? If not, he is evil. The nature of good and evil. That was cool. That was cool. Uh, hopefully you learned something from this one. Less textual than I've been in the past, but uh, still somewhat textual, I hope. Anyway, um, I hope that this can help to for you to be able to see the Old Testament with fresh eyes. We, we run into this problem with some frequency um, that we somehow think the God of the Old Testament to be this cruel person without realizing that, that things are neither 
good or evil on their own right, but only insofar as they relate to God. And if we start from that standpoint, we really come to a better appreciation of what God does, not just in the Old Testament, but in general, and um, are, are able to, I would say, more faithfully trust in whatever things God happens to be using. Because, again, the movement from the specific to the general, God may be using uh, wicked people and things today to accomplish his purpose. Anyway, uh, with that thought out there, let's pray. Dear Lord God, you are holy, and as we come to be your sons and daughters in baptism, you make us holy. Continue to help us live holy lives, trusting in you and following your word. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, this is sort of a halfway point in the book. I don't know if we're chapter-wise halfway. I think we're a little more than halfway done chapter-wise. But this is sort of um, something of a line in the sand. And then when we pick up next time, we'll have kind of some new-ish stuff uh, to talk about. So come back for that. God's peace be with you. I will see you next time.